Hey guys, welcome back to a new episode of the show. And I have to say, when I started getting into this review, it actually got kind of weird when I realized the original movie, The Ring, came out 15 years ago. The sequel, The Ring 2, came out 12 years ago. And that span of time will prove to be significant because in many ways, Rings is a movie that seems to forget what time it takes place in. Now, this review is really about the new movie, Rings, the third installment in the Ring franchise. However, I felt it was necessary to kind of go back and watch the first two movies as sort of a refresher, so I'll be talking about those briefly as well. When The Ring came out in 2002, it was a really successful film. It made a ton of money and basically started the whole Japanese horror remake trend we would see in the next few years. I'll never forget being in high school when the movie first came out and everybody was talking about it at the time. And I'll never forget this one girl who, like, she actually, she actually, like, taha that. Like, she really did. And she just was harping me nonstop, like, oh my god, Mark, you have to The Ring. You still haven't seen The Ring. It's like, the scariest thing. You have to say it. Oh my god, it's the scariest thing I've ever seen. Now, there's a lot of things I have to give The Ring credit for. It's not your typical horror movie. In fact, I would say it leans more to being a supernatural mystery, if anything. There's a few jump scares here and there, but overall, the movie relies on atmosphere to scare the audience and create a very unsettling mood, which is something that can be very difficult to do. And I think the movie does this very well. Naomi Watts also really shines in this movie. She's one of the best parts about it. And I also really liked the use of the ticking clock. The movie keeps reminding you of how many days Rachel has left, building the suspense. But with all that being said, I do have my gripes with the movie. I always felt like the actions of the character Katie in the beginning of the movie never made much sense. At first, when Katie hears about the rumor of the videotape that will kill you if you watch it from her friend, she tells her that she watched it a week ago and seemed genuinely concerned about her well-being. Then she starts joking around about it as if it didn't actually happen. But then we find out that it did happen. So why would she be joking about it? Well, you might say that she didn't take it very seriously in the first place. However, she did, because she told her cousin she didn't have much time left. She told me. Katie told you she was going to die? She said she didn't have enough time. That sounds like someone who is actually concerned about what might happen to them or if something might happen to them. Now, the ending to The Ring is something I have kind of a love-hate relationship with. On one hand, it provides quite a twist when we learn that Rachel didn't survive because she solved the mystery of what happened to Samara. She survived because she made a copy of the tape. And it also gives us that iconic scene when Samara crawls through the television. But on the other hand, this twist ending actually devalues everything that came before it. The entire movie was about trying to solve the mystery of the tape in order to break the curse. Rachel and Noah do that. They find out what the images on the tape meant, they find Samara's remains, and yet because of the ending, all of that meant absolutely nothing. And not only did putting all the pieces together fail to change anything, but it turns out that by the time she traveled to the island, Rachel was no longer in any real danger. I've noticed online that some people seem to think that Rachel was saved because she made a copy of the tape and showed it to Noah. But I actually believe that theory to be completely wrong. Rachel is saved because she makes a copy of the tape. More of that in a minute. But Rachel was supposed to die on the Wednesday because that is the day she watched the tape a week earlier. She wakes up on Thursday thinking that she had broken the curse because she's alive. However, this is when Noah is killed because he watched the tape last Thursday. Rachel didn't bring him the copy until Friday. Noah was killed because he watched the original tape and never made a copy to show anyone. Rachel was saved because she copied the tape and Aiden watched it. There's more evidence to support this. When Rachel goes to visit Katie's friend, who reminds her that she has four days left. Somehow she knows when Rachel watched the tape. I'm assuming she's having some sort of visions or communication with Samara. Not sure why Samara would be in contact with her. She had nothing to do with watching the tape, but whatever. This whole thing happens after Rachel brought Noah the copy and before Aiden watched it. So the implication is that Rachel is still in danger at this point. And I have to say, I always found it kind of weird that copying the tape is what saved Rachel not any of the other stuff that she did. I mean, it's just kind of funny to picture the ghost of Samara just at the end of the movie like, ha ha ha, that's right, it'll never stop. None of what you did makes a difference. Not deciphering what the video meant, traveling to my hometown, 
finding out what happened to me and my family, figuring out why I died, confronting my father, uncovering the well, finding my remains, giving me a proper burial. None of that means anything. The curse will never be broken. Oh wait, you made a copy of the tape? <laughs> well then, um, kind of changes things. <laughs> but even still, I find it to be a good movie. The Ring 2 tries to take things in a different direction, but unfortunately, none of it really works. In this movie, the threat is no longer watching the videotape. It's Samara when she manages to possess Aiden. And there is some hilarious shit in this movie. Like this scene when they're driving down the road and then out of nowhere just suddenly get attacked by deer. I never understood this scene. I have no idea what the deer have to do with anything. And on top of that, the actions of the characters don't make much sense either. First, there's this weird and kind of funny moment that Aiden has at the fair when he's walking around and off in the distance this deer spots him and kind of gets like triggered by him. Then in the car driving, the deer just walks out in front of the car. Rachel slams on the brakes and Aiden starts yelling at her not to stop because I guess maybe he can sense that the deer are going to start attacking. So the attack happens and Rachel peels off. Another one rams into them and then Rachel stops the car again and asks, Hey, why did you tell me not to stop in the first place? Maybe the time to ask these questions would be later. Is this really a concern right now? I would think getting far away from this area would be at the top of the list of priorities. So then a bunch more deer show up and do absolutely nothing. I think the idea is that the deer can sense that Aiden is possessed by an evil spirit and want to attack him. But if that's the case, why didn't they continue to attack? Did Samara use her powers to stop them? At one point, Aiden tells Rachel they shouldn't talk about Samara because she's listening and that she can always hear them, except when they go to sleep. She can't hear them in their dreams. I guess it's because she never sleeps. And where do I even begin here? Like, what's the plan? You're gonna just go to sleep and start having a conversation with each other in your dreams? How do you do that? Unless you have one of those Inception dream machines kicking around, I don't even know how you'd go about doing that. And does anybody else like find this kind of ridiculous considering everything else she can do? You mean to tell me a spirit with supernatural powers who has the ability to communicate to people through their dreams, crawl through television screens, kill you just by looking at you, can possess a child through his dreams, take over his body, use her psychic abilities to convince people to kill themselves. This spirit can do all of this and more, except hear you in your dreams. She could possess you in your dreams, no problem there, but holy shit, she's just gonna be death through the whole process. So if you wanna talk about something, just start knocking back shots of NyQuil, and she's just gonna be like, ah, oh, Well, sh now this is completely out of my realm. And here we are at Rings, finally. Now there's some irony with this movie, because in the world of The Ring, the curse is spread by making a copy of a copy of the videotape. And in many ways, this movie actually feels like not only a copy of the original, but it feels like it tries to mimic and copy many things other movies have done as well. And it even starts with the poster. I've seen this kind of poster design so many times before, years ago. I didn't even realize that this was still a trend. So Ring starts on a plane, and it's amazing at how this scene really sets the tone in terms of the quality of storytelling you're about to experience for the next hour and 40 minutes. This scene starts with a completely realistic conversation between two strangers when the girl says to the guy, life sucks when you can't sleep. Life sucks when you can't sleep. This is gonna sound crazy, but you ever hear about the videotape that kills you after you watch it? Suddenly, Emily was really starting to regret going out of her comfort zone and talking to the guy across the aisle. So a plain guy goes on to start talking about how he met a girl at a party who sent him a videotape. The second it was over, my phone rings. And this girl says, I'm gonna die in seven days. Except the only thing is that, as we all know, Samara doesn't tell you you're going to die in seven days. She merely says, seven days. That's it. Now there is the possibility that he's heard of the legend of the tape before, and that's why he's kind of filling in the blanks here. But I would argue that 
he would have also learned how to save yourself by copying the tape as well, because it got to him. And the girl who gave it to him obviously knew how to save herself. I mean, we live in the age of the internet, right? And here's something I've noticed in all the movies. The characters, for whatever reason, know the exact time that they initially watched the tape. And there's just no reason to believe that they would notice that kind of detail. Play it. Just play the thing. Come on, I got two minutes here, please. All I gotta do is make it to the next five minutes. Unless you knew what was gonna happen to you before you watched the tape, there's no reason why you would make a note of the exact time that you started watching it. So plain guy goes to the washroom just as her friend comes back and starts asking about the guy. Some video and a chick calls you on the phone after you watch it and says seven days, which was like right now. Again, although that is correct, that is not what he told you. I know it sounds like I'm nitpicking here, but I find this stuff really annoying when it comes to writing. If you were repeating this to someone, you wouldn't go from what he told you, this girl says I'm gonna die in seven days, to this chick calls you up on the phone and says seven days. That just doesn't make any sense. A few years later, Gabriel finds an old VCR which used to belong to the guy from the plane scene and decides to buy it. In the next scene, he's fixing the VCR and the same girl that he just met is there with him. So I guess they're dating now or banging. Maybe she just couldn't resist his hipster perspective on old technology. And now it's just a bunch of outdated junk. I prefer vintage. And now we meet our two bland main characters, Julia and Holt. Holt is about to go off to college, so as he's leaving, he gives Julia the gift of his shirt. So then, after days of not hearing from him, Julia goes to his school, goes into his dorm room, which was unlocked for whatever reason, rummages through his things, and finds his phone on the floor. Then she checks his class schedule to see where he might be and finds a key on the bulletin board. Might as well steal it, why not? So after she goes to the lecture, she sees his friends, and I, I love how they're just shitty to her for no reason at all. Hey, I remember you guys from- Why do you come here? Come on, dude. Move along, there you go. There you go. Why you come here? Like, gee, I'll give you three guesses. I just don't see what the problem is here. Like, you barely had any interaction with her, and what kind of response did you think that was gonna get? Oh, you know what? You're completely right. Why did I come here? Seems like everything is completely fine. Nothing out of the ordinary at all. I'll just see myself out. So Julia follows the professor and sees him go into an elevator and up to the seventh floor. The only problem is that when she gets into the elevator, the button for the seventh floor doesn't seem to work. And then it hits her. Oh my God, it must be the secret key. I guess it's a good thing Holt left his room unlocked with the key in plain sight so that I could steal such an important piece of the puzzle. On the seventh floor, there's a hallway with an old tube TV and a video camera recording the hallway. I don't know what the purpose of this is. At first I thought it might be for security, but nope. Julia is able to walk right into whatever the hell this is, some kind of weird, supernatural studies club. Like I said, Julia is able to walk right in completely unnoticed. You'd think that this group would try to keep whatever it is they're doing kind of secret, but it's not until she's able to eavesdrop on a conversation and start to leave that this happens. But you're not supposed to be here. So Sky only has like 30 minutes left before she's killed by Samara, so she convinces Julia to come back to her place. Sky's plan is to show Julia a copy of the video in order to save herself, but for some reason, this takes forever. I really don't know why. She's just sitting there on the computer typing away for over three minutes. What are you typing? Why are you typing? Like when she finally copies the video, just watch! Right click, left click, done! So what was all the typing about? Did you like have to hack into some server to get the video? If you knew you had to show someone a copy of the video to save yourself, wouldn't you have a copy of it on your computer? Like ready to go at all times? I would carry that shit around on every piece of technology I had. Hey, you wanna check out this cool video? Here you go. Boom, done! Mission accomplished! Saved! And why do people always seem to leave this to the last minute, literally? In the second movie, I can kind of understand because you have to give someone a physical copy of the tape and you'd have to be sure they watched it. But now? This goes back to what I said about the movie forgetting what time it takes place in. You have seven days to make a copy of the video 
which takes less than two seconds because it's a digital copy now, and show it to someone, and you're having trouble doing this? Like, holy crap, I wonder where I could post a video for someone to see. You know what, honestly, just like, just pick an app. Pick one. And she's a chick that makes it even easier. Tinder, profile. Hey guys, swipe right if you like hookups. But first, you gotta come over to my place and watch this video I made. The phone would explode in your hand. I get that maybe Gabriel wants to track the people who have watched the video, which they call tails. But honestly, if it's coming down to the last few days and he still hasn't found anyone and he's like, hang on, I'm still trying to find you a tail. I'd be like, yeah, screw you, man. I'm throwing this up on YouTube and giving it a clickbait title. You can go f yourself. So while Sky is copying the video, Holt starts texting. Apparently he hasn't responded to anyone because he got a new number. Oh, okay, get a new number, but I guess keep the old number on the old phone as well? Might as well just throw that under your bed and never look at it again. And it took how many days to get a new number sorted out? Again, what year is this? What, what phone is he using? Do you have to crank it first? No, it appears it's the same phone, so I guess he just got a new number at some point in between her finding his phone and going over to Skies, which really doesn't explain why he hasn't been contacting anyone. So it seems like time is up for Sky as the TV turns on automatically and we all know what happens next because we've seen it before. She tries unplugging the cable and the power, but that doesn't work. I like how the option of just trying to leave the room doesn't even occur to her. I mean, it's not gonna work, obviously, because Samara can just teleport to wherever she wants, but for once, I'd just like to see somebody try it. Remember when Samara first climbed out of the TV in the first Ring movie? When this first came out, it was a really big moment. Here, they try to do the same thing with the flat screen, of course. The only problem is that it lacks any of the shock and surprise that the original had. We've seen this all before, all of it. So as Julia's leaving, Holt finally shows up. And the thing that just gets breezed over here is that Holt wasn't in his dorm room. He wasn't in the lecture. He wasn't at the ring club. So where has he been this whole time? I've been planting bombs. Seriously, the movie never explains it. Never even tries. It never even comes up. So Holt is really worried because he doesn't have a tail and time is running out. Gabriel tells him just to hold on. Again, why would you wait? Are you really gonna take your chances after what just happened to the other chick? Holt tells Julia about the video and the secret club and that he doesn't have much time left, so what does she do? Late at night, she goes onto his laptop and watches the video in order to save him. Keep in mind that he hasn't explained anything to her about where he has been or why he hasn't returned any of her messages or calls and you're just gonna go ahead and risk your life for this guy? Sure, boyfriend who left for college and has been ignoring me ever since, and I suspect might be cheating on me and then tells me he joined some kind of weird secret death ghost club. I'll take a bullet for you. Holt then tries to explain why he was ignoring Julia. You know why I wasn't answering your calls, right? It was to protect you from this. But seriously, <laughs> If you were in Julia's position here, would you believe that excuse from the person you're dating? Yes, I was ignoring you, but it was only to protect you. I, I didn't think you'd actually care. Anyways, the video Julia watched had some extra footage mixed in. One of the things was a bird on the ground. And sure enough, as they're driving, a bird flies right into the windshield. And this is amazing. Julia is able to run back and instantly spot the bird under the dark overpass, but she's unable to spot the giant truck bearing down on her with its headlights. So they go to Gabriel's place where they try to copy the video, but it won't copy for some reason. And as they look further into it, it turns out her copy has more footage in it somehow. So because Julia saw an image in the new video of a burning skeleton, they decide to go dig up Samara's body and burn it because primitive cultures believed that's how you free a soul. Julia and Holt start asking around town about Samara's mother, Evelyn. Excuse me, who's the girl in this photo? Oh, that's Evelyn. I think I saw her. That's not possible. She disappeared 30 years ago. No. 
Wrong. Here's where we get a nice big dose of the movie just seemingly forgetting or confusing details of the characters that were established in the previous two movies. Not once, but twice they mention the disappearance of Evelyn happening 30 years ago. No, it didn't. 30 years ago would be 1987, but since this movie was supposed to come out two years ago, let's just say 1985. Hell, you know what? Forget it. Let's just say the 80s, period. Well, Evelyn didn't disappear in the 80s because as established in the first movie, Samara was born on March 9th, 1970. In The Ring 2, it's well established that Evelyn was admitted to the St. Mary Magdalene Women's Shelter when she was eight months pregnant, gave birth to Samara in the shelter, tried to kill Samara by drowning her, and was subsequently committed to a psychiatric hospital where she remained, obviously, because she was still there as we saw in her scene with Rachel in The Ring 2. Either. I have done more research than they did writing this movie just by going back and watching the first two movies, or they purposefully changed the timeline and just expected no one to notice. And I think they did that because otherwise the character of Burke would have been too young for the events of the story to have made sense. So anyways, Gabriel tries to meet up with them, but unfortunately he gets into a car accident on the way. Probably wouldn't have happened if he wasn't driving that old shitbox. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Vintage shitbox. Anyways, he actually survives the accident, but then the movie tries to turn into Final Destination when a power transformer comes crashing down and electrifies the stream of water that the car was sitting in in turn, electrocuting and killing him. It's at this point that Julia and Holt start putting the pieces of the puzzle together, and as an audience member, you can't help but feel that the movie is going down pretty much the exact same path the first movie did. Watching a video, trying to figure out what the images mean, traveling to a different town, talking to the locals to try and get information on the family members, trying to find Samara's remains in an attempt to set her free and break the curse, Uncovering what happened to the mother, again. Meeting the father, again. Oh crap, look, a major piece of the puzzle where finding out what happened to a character leads us to ripping up the floor and finding the place where they were trapped. This is essentially the same story, except the element of surprise wore off 15 years ago. Also, as I was watching this, I found it nearly impossible to trust that anything Julia and Holt discovered in terms of what happened to Samara's mother would really matter at all. The first movie already pulled the rug out from under you at the end. So as an audience, there's no reason to believe that anything that happens here would cause any real change. If decoding the video and discovering everything that happened to Samara in the first movie didn't break the curse, why would revealing what happened to her mother do anything? So anyways, they find out that the priest kidnapped and raped Evelyn when she was younger and kept her locked up underneath the church. For some reason, they try to shoehorn the cicadas in there. I'm not sure why. They were never really part of the story before. Flies were, but not cicadas. Are they trying to go for a kind of Buffalo Bill type thing with the moths? You're Samara's father. You kidnapped Evelyn. The night that I laid with her, I heard them. The cicadas. You moved her bones and she's still your prisoner. Okay, so that's it. That's the significance of the cicadas? You heard the cicadas when you were having sex with Evelyn? That's, that's the meaning behind that? Holy shit, yeah, if I die, <laughs> there might be a curse if you start hearing random sports center highlights going on. Just like in the background, just da na na, da na na. Oh shit, he's here! Also, you took her bones and now she's still your prisoner? Who? Samara? Samara was never your prisoner. Evelyn was. I mean, yes, technically Evelyn was pregnant with Samara at the time, but let's let's get real here. Which brings me to another question about this whole thing. Burke kept Evelyn prisoner under the church, locked up in chains. So it makes you wonder how at eight and a half months pregnant, she managed to escape. She obviously escaped. That's what all the images of her walking along the side of the road are. She made it to the woman's shelter, so... Uh, 
but the movie never tells us how she got away. Anyways, Julia gets out of Burke's grasp and tries to escape the house. Then Burke turns off the lights and suddenly it's like this has become a poorly done mix of Don't Breathe and Silence of the Lambs. So Samara comes out of Julia's phone with the help of a bunch of cicadas, heals Burke's eyesight and kills him. Then they take Samara's bones, which were hidden inside a wall, and burn them, but again, you know that this isn't going to do anything, and of course it doesn't. The next day, Julia takes a shower and starts coughing up some hair, and Holt discovers that the mark Samara left on Julia's hand is actually braille and means rebirth. So what does this mean? Does this mean that Samara has possessed Julia now? Now this is my favorite part. This is when suddenly Samara infects the computer and starts sending the video out to all of Julia's contacts. And I love how they all start responding right away. There's not even enough time for them to even watch the video. And yet there's just an instant flood of emails and instant messages coming back. I mean, are you sure you really wanna do that, Samara? That's a lot of people. You know at some point someone's gonna put it up on social media. That's a lot of phone calls to make. And you're probably gonna have to outsource that to a call center. And honestly, I just don't think that's gonna be as scary. You know, you watch the video, the phone rings, you pick it up. You have to say hello three times before finally somebody responds and mispronounces your name. It's just not really the same effect. Yes, hello. Is this, uh, Rachel Keller? I just got a note for you here. Uh, let's see. Yes, um, seven days. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, seven days. Is that right? Like, is that how you do it? Hello? Are you still there? You didn't die yet, did you? I'm sorry, I'm new here. Um, but, you know, while I, uh, while I got you on the phone, um, you got anything going on this weekend? Like, do you have any plans? Do you got a boyfriend? Like, uh, what's your situation? Because thinking maybe we could um, get together, you know? Um, it is kind of your last weekend alive, so you might as well you know, spend it doing something fun. And that would actually work out great for me because I am not looking for anything serious right now. You know, it's funny, I, I I thought the last name looked familiar on the list here, but I guess I just didn't put two and two together. It, it's Tom, uh, from Dead Girl Communications. Uh, how are you? Like, how are things going? Obviously, it, it, like, the weekend was a great time. Uh, but anyways, um, we're, uh, the reason I'm calling is because I'm looking to speak with a uh, Aiden Keller. He watched the tape. Well, yeah, Rach, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the whole reason I'm calling. If you could just put him on the phone. And who is that? Is that like your, you know, your brother or your dad? Our son. Also, I have to say, the original movie, I think, kind of benefited from the time, you know, it was released in. Back in 2002, people still used VHS. Uh, DVD wasn't really, hadn't taken over completely yet. Um, but, you know, at this point, the, t the age we live in, you know, it's all digital. And I think that when you have a, a curse, it's always really cool to have like a cursed physical object. Uh, the idea of the cursed videotape, it's kind of interesting. The cursed digital file, it just doesn't really, it's just not the same thing. It just kind of loses some of that aura to it. I always wondered also with the tape, do you have to watch the tape in its entirety? Like what if you watch three quarters of it? You know, seven eighths, how about that? Are you still cursed? Like what if you, you know, 
watched it, but you heard you heard about the rumor. So you're like, well, I want to watch some of it. So you watch like half of it or you get up to like the last shot. And you're like, okay, stop it. It's just things I've always been kind of curious about. I, I, I think personally, you know, the cursed reel of film, the idea of that is really creepy, you know, but nobody's got projectors, <laughs> you know, lying around the house anymore, especially in 2002. So the cursed videotape still works. Uh, if you were to wait a few more years, the cursed DVD, yeah, it's not, it's just not really working anymore. Just let, let's just be clear. This is a sequel to The Ring 2. This is not a reboot. I read one review online that was like, oh, this is a reboot of the, no, it's not. It's clearly not. And if it, if it was intended to be a reboot, then that actually makes the movie even worse. I would say that makes this the worst reboot of all time then. I don't know what it is about that line. It reminds me of like the beginning of some kind of terrible ad for uh, like a sleeping pill or something. Life sucks when you can't sleep. I should know. I've been an insomniac for the past four years. Did everything I could to try and get to sleep. Eventually, I just started to resorting to late night activities just to pass the time, like puzzles and smoking, cheating on my wife. And then I discovered Dozol. But Dozol knocked me right out that even an earthquake couldn't wake me up or my wife finding out about my affair. 